Good. Let's welcome our online campus today. Happy Easter, Resurrection Sunday. We're so good. You're glad you're joining us there. And for all those in the house today, you look so good. I don't see any Easter bonnets. Uh, I tried to encourage my wife to wear one. She wouldn't do it. We got well, it's, yeah, it's it's not really a hat, but it's yeah, it counts. We'll give it give give you props for that today. Uh, but somebody said, a pastor, you finally look like a pastor wearing a suit. So I tell the wrestling team I wear a suit as a pastor for uh, Barian and Marion and for senior night uh, coaching. And uh, so today, also Easter Sunday, I got two, don't want to wear them out. But uh, it's so, so good to be here today and look at you all this morning and celebrate with you this, this day. Amen. Let's open up in prayer. Lord God, we thank you for your presence today. We thank you for this day and all that it holds and all that it represents, Lord Jesus. Lord God, I thank you for your word today. Lord Jesus, I may have an ability on an occasion to encourage, to inspire, or possibly even motivate, God. But I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you can save, heal, and deliver. So I ask, God, that your spirit, God, accompany your word today, Lord Jesus, and do what only you can do. Touch and change lives, God. For I may see a crowd, God, but you see each and every individual, God. I see their their Easter outfit today, oh God, but you see more than what they're wearing you see what they're carrying you see every situation and circumstance and i pray you speak to each and every person today in your name we pray jesus name the church said amen amen, amen. let's give a little one more clap off and a praise isn't he good appreciate the worship team today amen so we're going to open up in our text today in John chapter 14. You are going to get a whole lot of Bible. We believe in reading the Bible at church. It's a good place to read the Bible. Amen. John chapter 14. I'm going to read the first 10 verses. It reads this. It says, let not your heart be troubled. I want to pause for just a moment here. We're beginning. We're picking up uh, in what is really called the Last Supper. We're going to end our service today with communion. And this is leading up to the cross, to the resurrection, really this is, could be considered the most intimate moments that Jesus has with his disciples. A conversation leading up, and we're going to go all the way to the cross and look at some different uh, uh, instances that the Bible brings out, but we're going to see this in John 14, 10. He's talking to his disciples. He says this, Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may also be. And where I go, you know, and you know the way. Thomas speaks up and says to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. (laughs) And how can we know the way? I love the disciples, man. They are real. We try to, like, idolize, spiritualize, put them up on this pedestal, but there's real folk, real questions, and sometimes they speak up and show how much they're like us. And, it, and he speaks up and say, NLT says it this way. I like this. He says, no, we don't, Lord. I mean, what are you talking about? It says, it goes on in the NLT. It says, we have no idea where you're going, so how can we know the way? This is Jesus being real and honest and open. His last supper, his last conversations, and this is how it's going. And Jesus says to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you have known me, you have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip says to him, Lord, show us the Father. And it is sufficient for us. Jesus says to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the work. Point number one, the fruit of the Spirit, Jesus is patient. Even when we vocalize our worry, our doubt and confusion, Jesus is patient. We're telling the Easter story, come on, Fruit of the Spirit edition. 
what got Jesus through the final moments of his life. The most trying a week, challenging week, a trouble-filled week of any man on earth has ever seen since. And what got him through, we're going to see the fruit of the Spirit come through strong in Jesus' life. He's talking with his friends, his disciples, three and a half years of ministry. And it comes down to this. Come on, where we might have got frustrated and slapped Philip upside the head and thrown some food at Peter, uh, Peter and Thomas. And he is patient. Can we thank God for his patience today? John chapter 13 Verses 2 through 11, John 13, 2 through 11, says, And supper being ended, the devil already having put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments. This is Jesus. He took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter. I love these moments. And Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Come on. NLT says, or he says, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answers him and says, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. NLT reads it this way, Jesus' response to Peter, his, his, his uh, objecting this, uh, Jesus says, unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. Simon Peter says in response, Lord, not only my feet, but my hands and my head. Jesus says to him, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore, he said, you are not all clean. Point number two in the fruit of the Spirit, Easter edition. Jesus is gentle. To wash the feet of his disciples. In the moments leading to the garden, to the cross, Jesus is gentle. Come on, listen. To the believer who is stubborn. Can you thank God for that? And insist that God should do things a certain way. And even to those who betray him. Jesus was in the crowd. His feet were in Jesus' hands. Jesus washed even the feet of Peter. Amazing. Amazing. Jesus is gentle. The fruit of the Spirit, Easter edition. Turn to Matthew chapter 26, verse 36 to 46. Told you we're reading some Bible today. I hope that's all right with you. Matthew 26, verses 36 to 46. Moving on from the dinner, the conversation. Moving on after the washing of the feet. It says, then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples here. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time he went away and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. 
Point number three, Easter edition, fruit of the Spirit, Jesus is faithful. To the weary and even the unfaithful, even in the face of extreme adversity, Jesus is faithful. Hallelujah. This next one is possibly my favorite one. I'm going to spend a few extra moments on these, and I even have a couple props here. Amen. John chapter 18, verses 3 through 8, reads this. Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went, away, went forward. <laughs> I love this. He went forward. Somebody say forward. And said to them, Whom are you seeking? They answered him and said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. Now when he had said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Then he asked them again, Whom are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go your way. See, Jesus displays self-control here. Don't put that slide up yet. Jesus displays self-control. We heard it Friday night. It was said this at the uh, Good Friday service. This is Erie First, I think. Thank you so much for all those that attended and, and went there. We had a great time that night, joined with many uh, other congregations and, and sought the Lord and worshiped. He said this when one of the ministers that spoke Friday night. He said, the strength it took for Jesus to lay on the cross and stay there when he had the power to come off it. Come on, true strength. That's an example of self-control. Self-control. Can you imagine? This passage said that, that they came. <laughs> they came. This one's a little bit brighter. They came with lanterns. They came with lanterns. Imagine the scene. Dark. In the garden. Maybe trees around and, and different things. It, call it the woods. It's kind of where we're where from, where I can picture it. They're in the garden. Darkness. Judas comes. We read the scriptures. Came with a, a, a band of troops. Officers. They've got lanterns. Coming to seek the light of the world. What are lanterns against the light of the world? This little lantern. A lantern to seek the light of the world. I thought that contrast was pretty cool. A lantern to seek the light of the world. They brought torches. <laughs> I'm going to have a little bit more fun with this one. You have to forgive me. We're, uh, we're reusing some props from something else here. Low budget uh, illustrations, all right? We get all our money's worth. There was some work put into making this. They came with torches. I really wanted, uh, I spent a little bit of time uh, surfing YouTube looking at how to make to torches. Jen would not let me make a torch and bring it in here. I was like, oh, no one will forget that message. She's like, yeah. And we'll be replacing ceiling and stuff. Dad did it one time. He burnt the mortgage in here. Yeah, I remember, yeah. I remember that. See, what it drove it on. So brought a torch. This thing keeps blowing up. They brought torches. Think of this. They brought torches for the one who is the consuming fire. What is a torch compared to the consuming fire? Hebrews 12, 29, Deuteronomy 4, 24, 9, 3, all refers to our God is a consuming fire. Come on, whose words, like Jeremiah said, are like fire shut up in my bones. They came with torches to the one who John saw and describes in Revelation 19 with eyes as flames of fire. They came with torches to the one who spoke from the burning bush to Moses and was not consumed. 
They came with torches whose fire came down from heaven onto the altar of old. They brought torches to the one who Nebuchadnezzar saw as the fourth man walking in the fire who had the appearance of the Son of God. They came with torches <laughs> to Jesus. I love it. What is your little lantern? What is your little torch? Nothing. It's a kid's toy <laughs> compared to Jesus. They brought weapons, it says. Lanterns, torches, and weapons. Brought their sword. <laughs> they brought their swords. Got a ninja sword here. <laughs> they went to the Orient. The, the, the wise men left it. They, they, brought, they brought swords. Maybe they put it together themselves. Anybody know what this is from? They, 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 they brought their swords to capture the Son of God. They brought their swords. Maybe we even step it up a couple generations. They brought their lightsaber. Huh? But yet compared to Jesus, it's just a toy. It's just a toy. They brought swords to use against the Lord of hosts, the commander of the angel armies of heaven. Matthew 26, 53 says this, Do you think I cannot call on my Father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? Come on, your sword is a toy. Come on, it might as well be made of wood stuck in Peter Pan's side. It means nothing in comparison. Woo, to the commander of angel armies. Wow. They brought sticks and swords to use to the one whose word, Hebrews 4.12 tells us, is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Can your little wood sword do that? Come on. Into the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. They brought weapons of man to a God fight. <laughs> like somebody bringing a, 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 a knife to a gunfight. It just ain't working unless you can throw that thing pretty fast. Come on, weapons of man to fight God. Jesus asked them, who do you seek? They replied, Jesus of Nazareth. What self-control Jesus displays in this moment to allow himself to be arrested and taken away. Think about it. But I love this about the Bible. I tell you, anyone that reads this book and thinks it's boring, man, you need to pray and ask God to open your eyes. Let's re read what happens in this. I love this about From the beginning of, of this encounter, I love how, how it's recorded here, how it says, he, he, he says, I am he, and they fall down as dead men. It's just the mention, uh, breaking the silence of his voice. The men, the soldiers, all fall down, backwards, on the ground. See, he makes it very clear from the beginning of, the, of this encounter, this is how it's going to go, boys. I love Jesus. Man, he goes, this is how it's going to go down. See, this is a pivotal moment when Jesus declares, I am he. He's not praying anymore, Lord, take this cup from me. If we can do it any other way, who are you looking for? I am he. He ain't running. He ain't hiding. Come on, he's stepping. The Bible says we read it ourselves. He steps forward. No more in debates. No more can we do this any other way. I love the Bible. He's not simply submitting to the men that came for his arrest or, the, or even the men that commissioned him. He knows their intent and their purpose for which they are sent. He is not simply identifying himself for the arrest. Listen, he is identifying himself with the purpose for which he has come. The Son of Man and the Son of God. In this moment... The will of man and the will of God both align and collide. The lamb slain before the foundation of the world. I am he. I am he. Words that changed everything. I am he. It is settled. We're not going to do this any other way. I am he. 
And they all instantly, without hesitation or any self-control, find themselves waking up on the ground. Can you imagine? Like, how did we get here? What happened? And they take a moment to gather their, their wits about themselves and looking at each other and kind of wondering just what happened. This is the moment when the hunter becomes the hunted. Did you ever try to sneak up on somebody to scare them and they catch wind of what you're doing and they, and they hide and they scare you? This is what happens in the garden. Can you think about it? These men gather with Judas, this, this, this uh, secret mission, and they come and they get a group of men together and we're like, we're going to surprise Jesus. Man, I grew up, see, I have a hard time not relating things to, to what I've seen. And so I grew up watching, my dad raised me on spaghetti westerns. Everybody heard of a man called Clint Eastwood? Come on. And my granddad, his dad, started feeding me Louis L'Amour books and started reading about these westerns. And I started comparing the Bible. I was like, man, this is like a western because the man rides off into the sunset at the end of the book with his bride. And uh, just kind of cool how you read things how, how, how you are and, and take it through what you're going through and what you've been influenced with. But it's so funny. I mean, every uh, villain story, think of a movie with a villain and a superhero, man. It all comes down to this moment. The, the bad guy sneaking up with the shotgun, walking through the woods like, we're going to get him, boys. <laughs> you know, they're coming through. And all of a sudden in the darkness, now forgive me, I'm not saying Jesus would do this. This is just what I see in my head if this was a Western movie. In the darkness, all of a sudden, the match lights, lighting that cigarette. What are you looking for, boys? All right. Please don't get offended. I'm not saying Jesus smokes. All right. But he ain't hiding. He steps forward. Who are you looking for? They say, Jesus of Nazareth. He says, I'm he. They fall down on the ground. Their weapons mean nothing. Lights are scattered. Torches are catching the garden on fire. Come on. They fall down on the ground. I love this moment. I love this scene. Here I am. Jesus isn't hiding. Death may have thought he was coming for Jesus that night, but it was Jesus who was coming for death. In the garden, Jesus showed it wasn't the plan of man unfolding. It was his plan. It was the Father's plan unfolding. Jesus reworded his statement. If you read it, he softened his tone by saying, I have told you that I am he. Letting them know that he was the one with real power and authority in this situation. He was the one allowing them to arrest him. And then in a moment, it's funny, we have this up here of like uh, maybe where Star Wars got their Jedi mind control. He says, I'm he, as I've told you, arrest me and let these ones go. <laughs> and they do. Who is in charge in this scene? I'm sure they had command to say, arrest him and everyone with him. Where'd you, where'd you everybody go? I don't know why we didn't arrest him. I can't remember, actually. I just remember getting up off the ground and being told I could now arrest the guy that we went to arrest. The self-control of Christ led to our salvation. I think that's a slide. The self-control of Christ led the way to our salvation. Self-control. Easter Sunday, fruit of the Spirit edition. What got Jesus through these moments? The fruit of the Spirit. Luke chapter 22, verse 50 to 51. Reading out of the ESV, it reads this. It says, And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. I think it's, this is recorded in all four Gospels, but John's the only one that rats Peter out. <laughs> It says, and we're reading in Luke, it says, one of them cut off his right ear. But Jesus said, no more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Can you imagine the scene, the chaos of everything being done and the, 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 just everything, all the nerves and all the emotion and all the stress on both sides coming together, and this happens, and Jesus, in the midst of all of it, reaches down and grabs the ear and puts it back on the, the soldier's head. Malchus, his name, physically experienced it. Those around him witnessed it. 
the goodness of our Lord. You can't stop the goodness of God. Not with a sword. Not with the blood from an ear. Not with lanterns and torches. The goodness of God. You can't stop the goodness of God. Hating on him, arresting him, or even trying to defend him, Jesus displays his goodness for all to see. The goodness of the Lord. Moving on, Matthew chapter 26, 59 to 68, reading out of the King James, says this, Now the chief priests and elders and all the council sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet they found none. At the last came two false witnesses and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said unto them, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witness against thee? I want you to underline these in your Bible or take this note. But Jesus held his peace. And the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said unto him, Thou hast said. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Oh, that set him off. Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now you have heard his testimony, his blasphemy. What think ye? And they answered and said, He is guilty of death. Then did they spit in his face and buffeted him, and others smote him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy unto us, thou Christ, who is he that smote thee? In the midst of all of this, the Bible says, Jesus held his peace. Think of this. His peace causes his enemies to rage. But their rage cannot extinguish his peace or stop his plan. The peace of God is greater than the chaos of this world. I'm telling you, if peace can keep Jesus, what can it do for us? The peace of God. Easter Sunday, fruit of the Spirit, addition, His peace He gives to us. Luke chapter 23, verses 33 to 34, says, And when they had come to the place called Calvary, There they crucified him, and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. Romans chapter 2, verse 4 in NIV, it says, His kindness leads us to repentance. See, the thief on the cross sees what's going on. He sees the the man in the middle, crucified, stripped of his clothes, the, the, the soldiers gambling and casting lots. He sees all of everything going on around him, how this one in the middle is even treated differently than the other two thieves in their same situation. And and he sees all of it and he hears the cry of Jesus from the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And he thinks, if he can forgive them, just maybe, he can forgive me. Just maybe he can forgive me. And He says in Luke 23, 42 to 43, it says, Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answers, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. I want to tell you the kindness of Christ. The kindness of Christ. It cries for forgiveness. And leads to repentance. 
The kindness of Christ brings penitent thieves into paradise. The kindness of Christ. Easter Sunday, fruit of the Spirit edition. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 says, Looking on to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, everybody say joy, joy. endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus saw past the pain and the suffering of the cross, and he saw his reward. And that, that vision brought him joy. And it, the, the reward wasn't a vision of his throne or reinstatement in his position in heaven or the glory that he once knew. It was the sight of you. Saved, healed, delivered. Come on, like the, the man who was possessed by a legion of demons. One encounter with Christ left him sitting, clothed, and in his right mind. That miracle was enough to scare the whole city. What kind of man is this? Wow. Sitting clothed in his right mind. The vision of that. Like the, the blind man seeing, the deaf hearing, the mute singing the praises of God, the lame leaping, and the prodigals coming home. He had a vision past the cross of every leper cleansed, the broken made whole. Come on, and the sinner forgiven and washed by his own blood for the joy set before him. He endured the cross. Wow. The cross couldn't cancel Jesus' joy. The joy of the Lord, of that Lord, the Bible says is your strength. We are not weak, church. There's a joy that even the cross couldn't stop. I thank God for his joy that's available to us in our situations and circumstances. The cross couldn't cancel his joy. Hmm. Easter Sunday, fruit of the Spirit edition. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. If you're taking notes today or you have your Bible out, underline, circle, highlight, uh, write down these words of Galatians 2.20. He loved me. You say that with me. He loved me. This is the Bible. He loved me. Jesus gave himself for me. Say that with me. Jesus gave himself for me. For me. Oh, and it's like the, the old days, uh, my mama's minivan had the visor across the front. It said, Jesus loves me. Across the visor. And it was written backwards. So when you're in your, your mirror or something, you see it, you're coming out, you, you can read it. Jesus loves me. And somebody stopped her one time. And said, Shouldn't it say, Jesus loves you? And she goes, what's it say? And she said, Jesus loves me. She says, that's right. You say it. You hear yourself saying it. You claim the gifts and promises of God. Jesus loves me. See, Jesus went to the cross in obedience to the Father. We read this. But he also went in the passion of his own love for me. For you. He not just uh, went for humanity, but he went for me. He saw me. He, he saw the me's of this world past the cross and through the crowd. He saw each and every individual. He saw the little old me's all through this earth. Every tribe, nation, tongue. He saw every me. He loves and he gave himself for me. Christ's love is for me. I hope you write that down today. 
I hope you take a picture of it and make that your screenshot, <laughs> your screensaver. Christ's love is for me. Not just the pastor or the priest, not just the elder or deacon, not just the, the, the regular church. Christ's love is for me. Not those that have done all the work and cleaned themselves up. Christ's love is for me. In every situation and circumstance, Christ's love is for me. No matter what kind of night I had last night, Christ's love is for me. Me, come on, the fruit of the Spirit is love. And everything else listed after that that goes along with the joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Come on, they are for me. They are all wrapped in, contained in the love that brought Jesus to and through the cross Come on, these nine fruit of the Spirit helped bring Jesus through the hardest week of his life, gave him the strength to go to the cross and beyond. And all of it, each and every one listed, is available to me, to you, to us of every age, of every experience, of every social status. It is available. What kept him in his time of trouble and equipped him for the work at hand is available for your life and my life today. It's available. The cross of Christ demonstrated his love for humanity. But I want to tell you on this Easter Sunday, while the cross demonstrates his love for humanity, the empty tomb just declares his power over it. <laughs> I'm so glad it didn't stop at the cross. Uh, the, the preacher Friday night said in his old church growing up, he said they, they'd hang them, they hung them high, they stretched them wide. But that is not the end of the story. Amen. Hallelujah. Sunday's on the way. I woke my kids up this morning. This is what happened when, you're, when your dad's a pastor or a worship leader. I do an old 90s song. It says, He Got Up. Clint Brown, baby. It's one of the best Easter songs ever written. I had that on repeat for 45 minutes. Went into the boys' room this morning. He got up. You know, going on and you went in the other room. And that's how you wake up on Easter in my house. Come on, he got up. Thank God for the resurrection. God, do you love me? I want you to look to the cross. God, I'm weak. I feel defeated. And I can't climb out of what the mess I'm in. I want you to look to the empty tomb. Because resurrection power is available for you. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. Come on, it shall quicken. It means make alive our mortal, not just our immortality. I thank God for heaven and the promise of things to come. But our mortal body needs lifted up out of the miry clay. Come on, let the world see a difference between the clean and the unclean. The saved and the unsaved. Righteous and unrighteous by the fruit of the spirit in our life today we will show forth his glory and his resurrection power amen for we live not just in the memory of what he has done for us or even in the shadow of that cross but we live in the power of the resurrected savior and in the glory of the empty tomb and in the baptism of his spirit. I thank God one day if he tarries and I'm in the ground, I'll be called up. But right now, today, he's got work for us at hand. Come on. And end times ain't scary to the church. <laughs> the news doesn't scare the church. I've got the good news. Come on. I told you like that Western. He's coming back and he's taking his ride home. Hallelujah. He's alive. He's alive. Whew. We refer to this week as Holy Week, but really it's all about a holy God who in passionate pursuit of his people, he could not be stopped and he could not be contained. The enemy couldn't stop him. Think about it at his childhood. They tried to stop, kill every child under a certain age. They tried to stop his childhood and they couldn't stop him. They thought he controlled his death and they found out they couldn't contain his resurrection power. 
In closing, before we prepare for communion, I want to just relate something uh, recent in the news. And I don't mean any disrespect, and I, I question whether or not to share it, but it's a teachable moment that God showed me something. I want to share it with you. But we heard of the horrible dis- disaster of the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore. Everybody heard about that. And we do, we pray for the families of the six men who tragically lost their lives in this incident. But I took a look at this bridge. It was a four-lane highway. It was 47 years old and 1.6 miles long. The cost of its construction will be equivalent today, or actually in 2023, so even more now, of $1.9 billion. It carried an estimated 11.5 million vehicles across it a year. And it collapsed on March 26 after a container ship lost power and control and struck one of its piers. This news story brought back to my remembrance all the sermons I heard about Jesus being the greatest bridge builder there ever was. For he made a bridge with two boards and three nails. Anyone ever heard that story? I began to think about it. This bridge has stood for over 2,000 years, has carried countless souls across it, It stretches from heaven to earth, and its price almost bankrupt heaven, for it cost the price of God's dear son. But I would like to add to that sermon today, just one little thought if I could, that Jesus being the master builder needed more material than two boards and three nails to build this bridge. He knew he would need a firm foundation, and there just so happened to be One stone that was rolled away. Revealing that Matthew 26, verse 8. He is not here. For he is risen as he said. Come on. The greatest bridge ever made. Two boards, three nails, and one large stone. (laughs) Standing the test of time. And I want to tell you today, this bridge cannot be shaken this bridge will never be destroyed the toll has even been paid you simply need to come to christ and walk with him across this bridge i pray today that if you haven't accepted the work that christ has done on that old rugged cross in that grave and out of that tomb that today you would accept him as savior The work he did at Calvary, the death, burial, and resurrection, receive him as Savior and King. And as we prepare our hearts for communion, I'm going to have my dad come up and Holly begin to play. And I just want to take a moment and let's just bow our hearts and heads to the Lord this morning. For we don't take this moment lightly. If you're here this morning and you haven't accepted Christ, you've heard about this story. You knew something about it, but it's never really come knocking at your door. I believe today it's knocking. The Bible says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and let me in, I will sup with him. I wonder today if there's anyone here, anyone watching online, that you've never accepted Christ as your Savior. You've never come to the realization that I know that the Father loves the world, but so much more than that, He loved me. I've heard John 3.16 that God so loved the world, but today I realize that He loves me. Would you just... Pray a simple prayer of asking him into your heart. I'm not going to call you up front. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I'd love for you to tell me after the service or send us an email if you're online. But It's not a magic word. We believe ask, believe, and confess. ABC, ask Christ into your heart. Believe he is Lord and Savior. Confess. Tell somebody. Just say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Savior and my Lord. I give you my life in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. If you're here.